you very much. Thank you, um, yeah. Ping Sun. I think this, this worked quite well. So, I mean, it was uh, very fast, but I could follow. So I posed a question in the chat and I would encourage um, the audience to also ask questions there. Um, the next talk, we should move on now because I'm already five minutes behind schedule, um, will be by um, Joe Scott, who just started sharing um, his screen. And um, yeah. Joe, so your talk is about banded fuzz, fuzzing SMT servers with multi-agent reinforcement learning. We're all curious to hear what that actually means. Um, I guess, please just go ahead. And I hope we can hear you. Joe, can you please say something? We can read you, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Hello, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Nice. Yes, Sorry. we can hear you. Uh, I, no couldn't find the, I couldn't find the button. I, I don't know why. Let me restart. Uh, oh, we can hear you now. We can hear you. Nice, nice. Thank you. OK. Yeah, thank, thank Everything you. is set. Awesome. Thank you for your patience. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Joseph Scott. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about a project I've been working on I'm called Banded Fuzz, uh, fuzzing SMT solvers with multi-agent reinforcement learning. This is in collaboration with my collaborators, Chishal, Hamad, Federico, and my supervisor, Vijay Ganesh, uh, here at the University of Waterloo and the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, first, I'll give some context and motivation. Uh, then I'll overview the tool. Uh, I'll present my empirical evaluation, and I'll conclude the project. Uh, so first motivation, so SMT solvers are integral tools uh, in several different areas, such as program analysis, software testing, and verification. And despite the overall complexity of the problem, tools have become extremely efficient on problems from industry. However, there are still some pesky inputs that exist that one solver may be remarkably slow to others, despite having very similar underlying algorithms. And it would be nice if we could have a tool that could find these tools uh, completely autonomously. And to this extent, we propose the tool Banded Fuzz. And Banded Fuzz is a performance fuzzer for SMT solvers. So the input to the problem is a set of solvers that are to be targeted and a set of solvers that are reference solvers or baseline solvers. And the output is a benchmark that maximizes the performance margin between the target solvers and the reference solvers. Uh, if you are a solver developer, at the bottom of the slide, you may be familiar with this sort of plot. It is called a cactus plot. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the total number of benchmarks solved. On the y-axis, we have the total time. Um, and usually, you want your solver to be further to the right. And here, you can see there's a bit of an outlier line, right? We see these lines with one solver performing extremely poorly to the other ones. However, and you would think that this might be just a poor algorithm, but this is actually a state-of-the-art tool. And these are uh, on benchmarks that uh, our uh, Bandit Fuzz was able to find. It's essentially trying to find benchmarks that have extremely skewed cactus plots. Okay, so what is a fuzzer? So a fuzzer is just a software testing tool that generates inputs to a program under test. Uh, fuzzers can be either uh, target find, try to find uh, inputs that cause errors in a program or slowdowns, and they use two common techniques such as uh, input generation or uh, input modification or mutators or seed mutators. And the way they usually implement these strategies, there's there's a variety, but commonly you see either purely random strategies or fixed strategies. And it's often oblivious to the online feedback that naturally comes when you do software fuzzing. And this is something uh, we hope to improve on and specifically with reinforcement learning. So why reinforcement learning for software fuzzing? Well, there's two real two paradigms of software fuzzing. There's black box fuzzing, which is very lightweight, but it could be the case because it's black box, you might be getting just low quality inputs and with smaller performance margins. However, uh, white box fuzzing, where you leverage program analysis tools under test, this can be very costly and it doesn't really scale at the moment to uh, tools as sophisticated as SMT solvers. However, when you actually do white box fuzzing, you do, could in principle get benchmarks with a larger performance margin. And the problem we want to sort of solve here is how can we get sort of the best of both worlds? How can we get, uh, exploit the input output behavior of the program under test? This sort of acts like an environment. 
uh, while uh, incorporating some sort of feedback loop in, within the fuzzer. And this is gonna to correspond to the actual reinforcement learning agent within the tool. So just a general framework for reinforcement learning. Uh, usually you define re a reinforcement learning problem in terms of a Markov decision process, a four tuple, where you have some states, some actions, some transition reward, and the agent needs to sort of figure out how to navigate through his environment to maximize his total reward by selecting actions. And really the final output is a policy, which is a way to determine how to select an action. And uh, reinforcement learning has been extremely successful, especially in empirical work. Uh, it's had breakthroughs, it's achieved master class in boardrooms like chess and go, Atari games, recently protein folding and drug discovery. Uh, it's state of the art for weather predictions. It's very predominant, uh, but it can be data inefficient. Uh, and th there's an issue here with performance fuzzing because, because of the nature of the problem, uh, a single environmental step can take several minutes or even an hour. So you need an extremely data efficient solution. So uh, in this paper, we're gonna propose the use of banded algorithms. So a banded algorithm is the stateless formulation of reinforcement learning. There is no states, there's no transitions, there's just actions and rewards. And at its core, the multi-arm bandit manages an exploration versus exploitation trade-off. You have to select the best actions that are known to you, which is exploitation, while trying to sample the lesser known actions, uh, which is exploring. Uh, MABs have been very popular uh, due to their simplicity and success in extremely noisy environments. Um, they're commonly deployed in things like online advertising, finance, and uh, recently it's uh, been state of the art in SAT solver branching heuristics. Okay, so I'll next overview the Bandit Fuzz tool. So here I have a figure architecture diagram of Bandit Fuzz. And essentially how Bandit Fuzz works is it learns how to modify a pre-existing input seed in a way to ma can keep maximizing the performance margin seen between the target solvers and the reference solvers. So what Bandit Fuzz gets is a set of target solvers, a set of reference solvers and constraints on the grammar of the problem. Uh, we generate new benchmarks with an agent and we modify new benchmarks with an agent. Uh, we run these benchmarks through the reference solvers and we get the performance feedback, and then we use this to compute rewards. Um, good. And because we are using bandits, the only thing the uh, agents really have to do is figure out how to modify the input or determine whether or not to uh, uh, keep the current one or start again. Uh, so yes, yeah, so let me define more precisely what I mean by a uh, performance margin. So let's just let L be the language of all the solvers, let T be the set of target solvers, let R be the set of reference solvers, and then let phi be just some empirical performance function. Banded fuzz seeks to find the maximum input uh, to maximize this performance margin function. Um, and in this paper, we're going to consider the part two, uh, the, the difference between the part two scores of the target solvers and reference solvers. So we specifically mean the minimum part two score of all the target solvers subtracted by the maximum of the part two score by all the uh, reference solvers. And uh, part two is just the, the real runtime of the solver if it's successful, otherwise twice the wall clock timeout. So we have two key components in the fuzzer. First is just the input generator, and it's not as it's 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 fairly straightforward, and it's inspired based off of other tools, specifically string fuzz. We just create a, a an AST and we populate it randomly based off of the problem. So we pick a predicate for the root, and we fill it in with other non-root constructs, and then we fill it out with either literals or variables. And in the mutation, what we do is we uh, fix we ask the agent to fix a construct. And we insert a novel occurrence of this construct into the formula. Uh, the way we do this is we just enumerate all constructs of the appropriate sort. We randomly select one, we fill it in, and then we have to perhaps rebalance the tree on an arity issue. Um, just to give an example, say we have uh, a single asserting AST floating point equality. Uh, the absolute value of X0 is equal to the absolute value of X1. Uh, under our modeling uh, with the various uh, floating point of constraints, if the agent chooses to add an addition, then we have the following possible outputs. Um, so it has a lot, like every time an agent selects an action, there's a large number of possible formulas that can be produced. Uh, so for our actual agent algorithm, we, we use Thompson sampling. And Thompson sampling is a really cool algorithm and it can fit on a single slide. 
So Thompson sampling presupposes the rewards are from a Bernoulli distribution. And they're either zero or one binary rewards. And it uses a beta distribution to model each action's expected value. So what we do is we initialize each action to have an alpha beta parameter of one. And while we train, we uh, sample each beta distribution to select an action by computing an argmax over it. If we get a reward, we increment the alpha parameter. Otherwise, we increment the beta parameter. Just to put this in the context, say we have an action space of two grammatical constructs, plus and minus, then for these two actions, we have two probability density functions. Uh, here we have alpha parameters initialized to one. Uh, say we uh, sample both dis functions, uh, compute an argmax, we select multiplication, then we create a new instance I2 by creating a new occurrence of multiplication from the existing input I1. And let's say, for example, sake I2 has a higher performance margin than I1, then we give the agent a reward. We increment that action's alpha parameter. We see the mean of this uh, distribution goes up and the deviation goes down. So it, it learns this is a better action and the deviation goes down. So we begin to exploit it a bit more often. Uh, say, for example, sake uh, we pick plus this time, we create a new instance by adding a new occurrence of plus. Let's say the agent doesn't receive a reward then in this case, we would increment that action's beta parameter and we see the mean shifts and the deviation goes down. Let's say we do it again. We create I4 by creating a new occurrence of plus again. Uh, and this time we get a reward. Then we increment the alpha parameter and uh, we see that the mean is now back to a half, but the deviation keeps going down. Um, let me go into the empirical evaluation. So we consider two baselines. First, just random fuzzing. And the second one is just going to be a single agent performance fuzzer because this is a, we, we are including multi-agents here. Uh, so the way we do this is we run each fuzzer for 48 hours, and the output is just a single benchmark uh, to maximize the performance margin. We repeat this process 25 times to produce an input suite of 25 different inputs for a particular logic. Uh, and we do this for 52 logics from SMT Comp 2020. We target the competition winning tool. So we're trying to make the best known tool according to the SMT Comp uh, slow on a benchmark suite. Uh, if the best solver isn't uh, available or runnable, then uh, we use the second most available tool. Uh, all experiments were performed on a nice cluster that we have available to. I have a few tables of results. So uh, on this column, I have the logic and consideration. Here I have the target solver for this particular logic. Here I have the reference solver for this particular logic. Uh, here I have the PAR2 score of the PAR2 margin score of random fuzzing. And then here I have the PAR2 score margin of bandit fuzz. And then here I have the improvement of the baseline. And then here for another set of logics, I have an, an exact same table of the same form. And across both tables, you should like bandit fuzz uh, very clearly improves on uh, random fuzzing can vary consistently across all of these logics. And then against another baseline, we consider previous work of just a single agent in the feedback loop. Uh, we baseline against the native code of this tool, which only supported floating point and strings. Here we see consistent improvement. And we adapted this new code to follow their algorithm, even though they don't support, they only support these two logics. And once again, we do see consistent improvement over the baseline. Uh, we did do some case studies with solver developers, specifically Z3STR4, CVC5, and Bitwizla. And uh, we, on the right here, I have a cactus plot targeting Bitwizla against a bunch of other solvers. And even though Bitwizla won the competition uh, several, like several years now, uh, Bandifuzz was able to generate a set of benchmarks that make it seem like it, it might not be able to win the competition. But these benchmarks aren't in the competition suite. So. Uh, but uh, it was it was a great pleasure to work with these guys. Thank you, Ina, Matthias, Martin, Mita, and Murphy. Uh, just to conclude, uh, in this talk, I presented Bandit Fuzz, a reinforcement learning fuzzer. Using Bandit Fuzz, we were able to generate multiple test suites exposing significant relative performance differences across several uh, common solvers and logics. Uh, the code of this tool is available here, and here's my email if you have any questions. Thank you all so much for your time, and please let me know if you have any questions. Well, Joe, thank you very much. Right on time and a very nice talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? I didn't see a raised hand, nothing in the chat. Okay, um, I was wondering, so um, I, I, it was a bit quick for me. I didn't, couldn't fully follow what, uh, what logics you support in the SMT server, so what, what theory. Uh, 
ghost ah, behind it. So we, yeah. uh, we, we, so it's it's we we have a flag for each theory, and then it produces benchmark the it produces a benchmark of that logic. So you can specify if you want floating point or integers or reals. Oh, it's yeah. just a command. It's just a boolean command line flag whether or not to to en enable the generator to include these theories, and then we create the. And then it creates benchmarks of this logic. So actually, it, it supports all theories of SMT lib. It, un yeah, it supports everything. I, yeah. I was guessing it would. So that's very nice. And then is, is, is it somehow dependable on what, what logics you're using? Or would you say it just doesn't matter because it's kind of a more high level approach here? So, so the action space are the constructs of the logic. So it automatically yeah. loads all, all of the constructs of the logic and it forms an action space based off of that on the fly. So there so are just there a are, larger action space. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the action space increases. So it, there is a bit of, there should be a bit of a correlation with the difference between uh, like the random fuzzing and and in principle, there should be a correlation between like the random fuzzing and the uh, bandit fuzz if there's a lot of theories because there's more actions and it's a harder learning problem. But the solver performance margin might also be a bit wider here. So that's not necessarily true as well. But that's a very good point. The action space yeah, does I mean, have an impact on the, on the eff efficiency of the tool. Yeah, I can imagine. But also the reward setting, right? Because a reinforcement learning often has problems with uh, if you have very sparse reward settings. So this depends a bit on how you design this here. Yeah, that's very oh, true. That's very true. Yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Very thank nice you. work. Um, thank you again. Thank you very much. And no um, we made up a few minutes so we can move to the next talk. Awesome. Thanks Cheers. again, Joe. Thanks a lot.